Welcome back to the show. We're live from Los Angeles. Thanks for staying with us. Former Oklahoma and NFL linebacker with the Seahawks. He's an actor now, Brian Barsworth. Welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate uh, you having me here. Nice of you to hang out on Valentine's Day. Any special plans on this uh, festive day? Well, honestly, I got up this morning and did my Valentine breakfast, but that's like an ongoing thing at my house. You, you know, cook I, breakfast I do for the family? all the breakfast because no one wants to cook breakfast. Wait, have you have two kids? I have two beautiful daughters, yeah. And, uh, they, they are a majority of my life, so I enjoy spending a lot of time at home with them. Out of the NFL since 89, what are the priorities in Brian Bosworth's life these days? Really, it just evolves around my family, to be honest with you. Right after I got out of the, out of the league, um, I floated around as far as what I needed to do yeah. mentally to find uh, an area to go to, to identify with. And uh, luckily for me, I, I, I always had a longtime girlfriend who's now my wife. We've known each other since we were 13 years old, and she went through the ups and downs with me. So she knew what really was inside of me, and she knew how much I missed the game of football. So she hung with me, she stuck with me, and we were blessed with, with a, a beautiful child that really saved my life and pulled my life out of the door. How did having a child save your life? It just, it kind of put in perspective the important things life had to offer. You know, it, it made me uh, go from a very selfish person to a very selfless person. And uh, having a girl, more than maybe having a boy at the time, was um, probably a blessing in disguise. Because uh, I just... Sensitivity maybe forced you to be more... It, it probably allowed me to touch a little bit more of my feminine side, and I know... Uh, my agent will probably kill me for that. Don't say, don't touch too much. Don't say, don't, yeah, don't say, uh, kill that, the but, macho image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, this you know. is Brian Bosworth we're talking about here, right? You're gonna, you you enjoy crushing people on a football sure, field. Sure, but at the same time, you know, you got to have that, that stability at home. Otherwise, it just your, your whole mental framework's out of whack. So, 89, it was traumatic arthritis that forces you into retirement in a career that was less than three years in the pro game. This is your life. How did you handle that? It was tough. It really was. For, for a long time, I really went through um, some, some serious nightmares and some withdrawals. Uh, I still have them. I mean, if, if, you, if you think, uh, if I dream about the game of football um, causes me to miss it, then I do miss it because I dream about it all the time. Um, it's, it, that was my life. That's all I did. That's all I thought about. That's all I dreamed about. And to get there and then not do what I really, really wanted to do, which was to excel at the, at the NFL level, um, was a disappointment to me. I know it was a disappointment to a lot of the fans. Did, did it hurt? And does it bother you when you hear Brian Bosworth in the NFL was a bust? It, yeah, it bothers me, sure, because... Do you I, agree I, with that? Uh, no. No, because once when I got in there, uh, the players and the coaches, they all have a, sp a perspective of, of how players play the game, how they approach the game, and how seriously they take the game. And when they get in there and they see the, in the intensity in the eyes of a football player, uh, and how serious he takes that game and how much it crushes him when he can't play that game and how much the team really means to, to individual players. I think they all realize down deep inside what kind of player I was. So you, you took the game seriously. Some may have viewed it differently when you got to the NFL level. What, why didn't you become the player that even you thought you would be? I think it, it, right down to the, to the nitty-gritty, it was just the injury. I got injured the very last game of my first year against Houston, and it was a... a an injury that I could not recover from. Linebackers need their bumpers to play. And I use my bumpers like uh, uh, you know, pinball machines use their bumpers. And I needed to use uh, my shoulders to play the game. And once it went south, there was no way of getting around, you know, coming back. And when we were playing in Oklahoma, you said you needed to hurt people. Some of the things that we recall, you needed it like water and uh, that without football, you might as well be a, a corpse. I mean, these were some of the things sure. that you talked about. So that anger that you had built up and, and also this passion for the game, you said it was difficult. How did you get through it? Well, that, that was the only way that I could find a way to excel in my life. That's the one thing that in my life I knew that I was good at. And I, I liked myself back then for that. You know, I could take the anger that I had inside me and wherever it came from, I knew how to channel that anger on the where, football field. Where do you think it came from? Did you ever wonder yeah, about it that? Comes from every, it comes from anything. It comes from, from frustration at school. It comes from frustration from my relationships with my, with my girlfriend. It comes from frustrations at home with my family. But you could channel it to the football field oh, only. Any, anytime that you can, you know, cold cock somebody in the football field, whether they're watching you or not, that's, that makes you feel good. At least it made me feel good. <laughs> you know, to watch something, you know, come out of a, an orifice makes you feel good. So when you can't do that, the anger, did you have to go to the therapy or a psychiatrist for, for help in, in not, you can't, you just can't walk up to people in traffic. No, you can't do that. Um, but I, you know, I, I had to learn how to rechannel uh, a lot of the energy that I had inside me. And, and give me an example of how you did that. Well, you know, uh, with regards to my 
to, to my child. You know, it was, it was difficult at first, because all of a sudden, you know, not being a very selfish person, I, I knew I, this is my time, I, I'm gonna go do my thing, and you know, don't bother me with, I know she's crying, but you know, she, I had to learn how to take on responsibility, take the priorities of life, and really learn how to, to, um, to love somebody else before I loved myself. So in order to do that, you really need to find focus where your energy is going, and that's, you know, it, it took some time doing it. It took a lot of support from my wife, but, you know, it was thankfully achieved. And that energy also into acting, and we'll talk about uh, your HBO movie coming out, One Man's Justice, but the play before we, we talk about Oklahoma here in the next section, in the NFL, remember Monday night in November 1987, and you, you won't forget, forget Bo it, Jackson, yeah. the run, this is what, you know, what people think of, Brian Bondsworth, I'm sure many things flash through their mind, but this, what do you think about when you see this? I got my head on the wrong side of the man. I didn't take him down. I'm not sure that I got, I, I wish I'd unloaded on him, uh, but I knew that uh, I, uh, I just didn't do what I had to do, and that was going in and knock the snot bubbles out of him, and the man was a heavy man, he's a hell of a football player, and unfortunately his career is over, just like mine is, but uh, that was a great play, and I wish, Unfortunately, it didn't come out the way I liked so, it. Did. So you're not embarrassed, but even though we won't let you forget that, I mean, that's part of playing the game. I, if that's the worst that ever happened to me on the football field, then, then I would be happy. But uh, there's a lot more on the football field that happened that I've been much more embarrassed about than that. We're talking with Brian Bosworth. We're live in Los Angeles. We'll continue here on Up Close. Still good friends with Barry Switzer. They talk off, and we'll reflect on those Oklahoma days and talk about Barry Switzer and Brian in a moment. Don't go away. Music Express, voted number one by the National Limit. Welcome back. We're live in Los Angeles, up close with Brian Bosworth, two-time All-American at Oklahoma, the Sooners went to two national championships uh, when you were there, both under Coach Barry Switzer, a man you called the king. Why? Mm -hmm. Man, he was. He was the king of, of Oklahoma. Not just question. the football team. You mean the whole state? Pretty much. I mean, he ruled the state of Oklahoma from the standpoint. It was Oklahoma is traditionally, you know, a football state, just like Texas is ruled by their sports, and Oklahoma is the same way. And 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 he he was so magnag magnanimous about really bringing the kinds of of, uh, of personalities to uh, to Oklahoma and, and allowing them to be free and individuals, and yet putting on the football field on Saturdays, a team that could just be a kick-butt team. Did you know? Barry Switzer play by the rules? Well, I believe he did, yeah. I think he stretched the envelope, so to speak, so that he allowed the players to feel that they were free and individuals and human beings as opposed to just, um, you know, just these these automatic, uh, automatic uh, uh, football players that were plugged into a, to a system. But uh, uh, he was a coach's play I mean, a player's coach, and it, it really helped the, co the, the players feel good about themselves and bring the best out of them on Saturdays. But you have admitted that it took you a while to, to grow up. It, it was Barry, was part of that his fault? <sighs> maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I, you know, I can't blame him for any of the things, any mistakes that I ever made, you know, because during the time I was growing up, I was still feeling my oats and trying to be a wild rebel at the same time. And, and well, should he have been tougher, though? Would that have been the better thing to do? For I don't know, because if you, if you think about it, me being a father now, I know that if I was tough on my, on my daughter, she's going to turn around and do exactly opposite of what I want her to do. He let me and allowed me to do the things that I felt were important to me and be an individualistic person at the time, um, which I really thought helped me gain the confidence that I needed to be a person that I am. Um, it, I'm much more well-rounded now. I appreciate the things that, that I, I have. You know, I'm living in grace and loving every minute of it. And all that is owed because a man allows you to live the life that, you know, you want to live, make the decisions that you want to make. You know? now, uh, how, when you say wild times there in Oklahoma, how, how wild? Can you give us some examples of, oh, this is cable, so, sure. but it's a family show right at the dinner hour. In well, I mean, you know, we were wild. I mean, we were young college kids that enjoyed the freedom of getting away from mom and dad. You know, you go into a college atmosphere and you bring in, you know, 90 guys from different areas of the United States. But, but did you get away with more because you were football players? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. And but that's that's a given. And I mean, of course, when we're 20 years old, um, you learn to expect it. It becomes a selfish habit that you have, um, and I think that's part of the the things that uh, you learn. And if you if you grow from those those mistakes that you make, then you're a better person. But if you don't, then you know you're going to be caused trouble when you're older. Would football players throw a cat out of a four-story building to see? 
he could land. No more than a basketball player, a track player, or a baseball so. player. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, I, but I don't know. That doesn't <laughs> a regular occurrence. Did that go on in Oklahoma? <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say whether that specifically went on in Oklahoma. Well, how about things, things like that? I mean, is that well, sure? There's some. There's some pranks. I mean, there. I've heard of stories where the heads of of deer have got thrown through uh, um, the sorority windows. Just uh, oh. you know. But well, then there's the head of the horse in the Godfather movie. But that's even more serious. Yeah. That's a different a different level. How about steroid use? You've admitted to steroid use, although only under doctor supervision. Sure. When you played in Oklahoma. Sure. What, did it go on otherwise? Oh, sure. You know, back then it wasn't, uh, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't looked down upon as far as, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the establishment was concerned. It wasn't until, I think, um, so we're talking, 86 or 87 yeah, probably, that they start, yeah, start really talking 80s. about it. But, but at the time, so not enough was known about it, but players would use it. How long, what percentage would you say? I would, I would just be guesstimating, but uh, I know some players used it to get bigger and stronger and faster. Um, other players use it to uh, to look better. Um, other players use it to get over injuries, things such as that. But it was so unknown back then that there wasn't really enough data on it that we could make a, a, an intelligent assessment of did, what we were doing to ourselves. Did Barry Switzer know about it? Did, uh, that this use was going on, taking place? You know, I, I never really came right out and asked Barry, you, you know what's going on here or not. Cause did he ever was, step in and tell somebody not to do it? Not, not to my knowledge, but again, it was like, you know, a dad coming in saying, "Don't drink that beer," and you know, as soon as he closes that door, he's going to down that thing with, in a in a funnel if he can. You know. But, but you're saying ultimately it was, it's your the player's responsibility, even at that age and at, in that situation, to you're talking to make about that. players and and young adults that are 18, 20 years old that are making decisions based upon the environment that's around them, the peer pressure that's around them. Uh, they're going to make decisions, good, bad, or indifferent, and they're going to have to live with those decisions. And yet, when the time comes down the road, we hope. And, and pray that they learn from those decisions. And that's all you can do. I'm, I'm, and Chris, back when you were 20 years old, I'm sure you did some things that you weren't exactly proud of. I, uh, yes. I, so, you know, <laughs> they just happen to be amplified, especially in my case, because of the things that were going on around in my life. And you wrote, right, in, in your book, The Boss, which is out in the late 80s, very good book, by the way, uh, a, lot, a lot of these Appreciate things were, were mentioned. Yes, right, we'll plug the book as well <laughs> as the movie. But when you used steroids, did you use it for health reasons to look better to get did it make you a better player what were the reasons you used to well, nothing was going to make me look any better uh, <laughs> my mother told me that um, I actually went to a doctor to find out what I could do to overcome an injury that I got in the Penn State game the, the game well, was when the shoulder or was it, so it, was, it was a deep thigh bruise and I had a uh, um, just uh, uh, a pain throughout my entire body that just resonated from that 